thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, I'll just allow time for the next speaker to make her way to the seat where she will come from. Uh, so the next speaker uh, goes by the name Rosanne da Silva. Uh, Rosanne is the president elect of the Actuarial Society of South Africa. So I think this room is uh, honored to have about three presidents. <laughs> one sitting in two president elects. <laughs> so she will be president for the 2016 to 2017 period. Uh, Rosanne divides her time between working as an independent consultant, consulting actuary in healthcare and employee benefits, her teaching and research duties at Vitz University, where she's adjunct, adjunct prof professor in the School of Statistics and Actuarial Science, and her service to the profession, which includes chairing the tuition committee and ex officio on the Transformation Committee. So transformation is essentially the theme that she'll be touching on as in her presentation. Uh, Rosanne has been working as an independent actuary since 1997, and she has been in, also involved in various regu regulatory reforms over the years. Her clients include medical schemes, retirement funds, corporates, and industry bodies. She has published a number of papers on wellness. I think uh, employers in this room would be pleased to take note of one of her papers uh, on wellness index in, in South Africa. Probably she could do something in Zimbabwe as well, and we could compare the wellness of our employees. AIDS and expanding access to health cover. Ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause to Rosanne. She makes a very good presentation. introduction and um, good afternoon to all of you. I think I'm going to start by saying first of all congratulations on your um, inaugural convention here. It's really great to see so many people um, attending and, um, and I certainly hope that I do a good job and that you um, invite me back next year um, and that your convention continues to grow from, from strength to strength because I think it's a very important part um, of, of what a, an actual society can do for your members is a sense of community and of course also the sharing of both technical and topical issues in a forum such as this. So I hope that with my presentation today that I'm going to hopefully add to the discussion um, and the debate because this is certainly um, quite a diverse topic as you'll, as you'll see and, um, and I've, and I've talked on this topic, the topic of transformation and diversity in a, in a number of, of forums. And, um, and I found that the best place to start is with the question of what diversity actually means, because it means very different things to different people in different contexts. So what we tend to think of, certainly in the, um, in the South African context where I come from, when we talk about diversity, is we talk about demographic diversity. So we look at our profession and we say, well, how representative are we relative to our, um, our population? And I found that when I've spoken in other forums, particularly in other countries, that perhaps that's almost a shallow way of looking at it. That, um, that in some places, diversity is seen as rather wider areas of, of practice. It's quite interesting that Mike McDougall always insists now, he's the CEO of the Actual Society, that we don't talk about wider areas of practice, but rather new areas of practice, because of the fact that we are expanding into different areas of practice, and they're actually becoming more part of the core work we do. And I see that the speakers that follow me, and Michael's going to talk about banking, and she's going to talk about the enterprise risk management, that these are new areas of practice, rather than what we traditionally refer to as, as wider fields. So certainly in international forums, diversity is seen as actually rather expanding where actuaries are working. So my take on it is, um, is in fact what we need to do is to be relevant to our stakeholders. That's the most important thing about, I believe, what we do as, as actuaries. Um, and I think that it's quite, that um, the presentation that preceded my and Rob's presentation really highlights that. That we need to have an understanding of what is important to our stakeholders and who our stakeholders are. And we also need to be relevant to the environment that we're working in. And when I talk about environment here, I don't just mean in terms of climate change, I mean in terms of the economic, the social, um, the, the way in which people think, the education levels that people have, 
that we need to be sensitive to those things as well. So certainly, in, and, and in my teaching, I, I, um, I try and, um, and instill this in the students, is the thinking <coughs> that what actually we bring as actuaries, our core skill as actuaries, is an understanding of the interests of various stakeholders and trying to balance those needs. That really is the essence of, um, of professional practice. And that suggests that we need to be able to understand what is important to different people and we need to have empathy in terms of their levels of understanding of what it is that they do and what their needs are. And, um, and also we need to have credibility that the solutions that we come up with are valued. So the question is that linking that back to the original thought in terms of, of diversity from a, a transformation um, perspective is that, that if we are transforming our profession, we are ensuring that we are remaining relevant to our environment and very important that we are credible to the stakeholders that we serve. So this is why it's a core philosophy in terms of the, the actual society of, of South Africa's thinking and, um, and I think certainly worldwide in terms of, um, of how we operate in different markets. So perhaps what is useful as a, as a next step is to talk a little bit about the strategic objectives of, um, of our society in, in South Africa and perhaps then that will be helpful in terms of, um, in terms of you um, developing your society here as well. And then I'll go on to, uh, to focusing on, the, on the, the diversity aspect of it. So what we do in terms of our focus, we had a, a strategic work session of the, the Council of the Actual Society um, two years ago. It was actually one of the very first meetings that I attended as a, as a council member was this day-long brainstorming session. So it was my baptism by fire. And the, um, and the outcomes were that these really are our, our strategic objectives and they are in, in order of importance. So most importantly is the provision of learning opportunities and growth. And you'll see that that is core to, to what I'm talking about when I'm talking about promoting um, diversity in our profession. The second one is brand and reputation management. And of course, an important part of this is making sure that we are credible in the solutions that we are, um, are offering. And what goes hand in hand with that is of course professional governance. And the professional governance embodies both the provision of, um, of professional um, guidance and professional guidelines, both, uh, both generally and, um, and specifically from a technical nature, and of course also the disciplinary process that again lends credibility um, to, those guide, to that governance. And then very importantly being an actual voice in the public interest, that, um, that the profession is involved um, in, in many times in, in regulatory discussion, and what is really pleasing now is that we have a very, certainly in South Africa, we have a very positive relationship with the various um, regulators and often advice is sought even before um, there, there, is, um, there is just a public um, comment invited. Um, and then of course provision of, um, of a, a, a long-term strategy for, for the profession. And as I'm talking through these points you can see that this point of, um, of, of diversity and transformation is interwoven into all of these um, strategic objectives because the, the long-term strategy for the profession has to be to be offering sustainable solutions um, to, to people's problems in the financial services space and in the general risk management space. And of course, being relevant and credible to the environment that we work in is a key part of that. And then there's the networking part, which of course is, is what we're doing here. The networking, the sharing ideas, the being aware of who is part of the actual community that you work in. And I think that's also a very important role that, um, that your professional body plays. And then provision of opportunities in the, in the public interest and, and public service. And um, this is where it plays an important role in, in, um, in the actual society of, of South Africa. And there are opportunities to get involved in terms of not just um, public service projects, but particularly in the space of, of, um, of financial services. One of the things that we've been um, doing is publishing a, a, a regular series of articles um, giving people advice in terms of purchasing certain products, the kind of protection that they need, how to evaluate um, products and services that they're receiving in the financial services space. So let me bring this back then to our, um, our key areas of focus from the, the Council of, of, um, of the Actual Society um, of South Africa and, um, and, and, the, and the executive. We're very fortunate in that we have um, a very strong executive in terms of 
three full-time actuaries and two other executives um, in the full-time employ of, um, of the actuarial society. And, um, and their main objectives are, first of all, enhancing the standing of the profession, exceeding member expectations. So in other words, if the members of the profession are receiving um, value from their, um, from their professional body, and ensuring sustainability by assisting council in those um, strategic objectives that I've shown you. So part, of course, of that enhancing the standing of the profession is making sure that we have um, a, a, a key transformation <coughs> policy, which I'm going to talk to you about now, and that our education is, um, is maintained at a high and internationally credible um, standard. And some people will see those as, um, as being conflicting objectives, and I'm going to demonstrate to you that I'm, I'm not sure that that's the case. And then, of course, there's the wider fields, which is part of the sustainability of the, um, of the profession and ensuring that there's um, um, a long-term view. So when we um, talk about transformation in the, um, in the actual society, um, as you mentioned in the, in the intro, we've now brought that as um, the Transformation Committee reports directly into council and, um, and as president-elect, I'm ex officio on that, um, on that um, committee. And, um, and, it, and essentially it's a forum for interacting with the various entities that are involved um, in different ways of uh, promoting transformation of profession. I'm going to talk in detail through those um, a little bit later on. But we need to seek opportunities in terms of, um, in terms of diversity, both in terms of transfer transforming who is in the profession, but also, and I think almost more importantly, transforming the way that the profession thinks. And that way we remain um, credible. So we need to stay relevant to our client needs as they change. Um, so we need to understand what it is that those, um, those requirements are. And of course, we need to maintain that credibility from the point of view of, um, mm. of the standards. And one of the key challenges is that there's a very long training pipeline here um, in terms of the time from school leaver to, um, to qualifying. And so changing the, the structure and the nature of our profession is certainly something that, that takes some time. What we do have is um, we put together a demographic model and, um, and later this month we'll be um, presenting some of the results of, of that model at our um, Young Members Convention, which is taking place in Cape Town at, um, at the end of this month. And, um, and that enables us to, um, to, to benchmark where we are and what, what we can realistically achieve given the, um, the timeline in terms of, um, of training in our profession. But it's quite important that, um, that we're able to, to market the profession to our stakeholders to demonstrate that we're remaining credible to, um, to our environment. So um, I'm not sure that you're all necessarily familiar with them. Um, with the way that the training works in, in, in South Africa. Um, we have the undergraduate degrees um, that take place at, um, at accredited universities. We have um, four fully accredited um, universities and two other universities that are partially um, accredited in terms of, of providing actual education. That, of course, leads then to postgraduate study where there's more opportunity for exemption from the board exams. And then there is the process of, um, of workplace study, which we call the, um, the normative skills, and then the fellowship level, where we have the, um, the professionalism exams. And of course, in this big, I can almost not even draw the triangle below, we have, um, we have the schooling system, which is really our, um, our flow of students into the system. And so part of the problem is that, um, is that we, are, um, we are dependent on the, the quality of students that are coming in from the, the schooling system in terms of, um, of trying to, um, to, to get people to progress through this qualification system. And, um, and the good thing in, in South Africa is we have a really good um, reputation as a profession for being something that is, um, is challenging. And, um, and so we have a, a news feed that we get um, of, of press articles. And um, in sort of January and February after the matriculants Results are all coming out. There's all these news articles about how the top um, matriculants are wanting to, um, to study actuarial science. And, uh, and it's quite interesting because when I met with the, um, the, the president of the Institute and Faculty in the, in the UK, they do not have the same sort of profession of, of choice. I think it's a very similar situation here that, that um, for, your, for your top 
um, uh, candidates who talk to the believers that, that the actual profession is a profession of choice. And I think that's something that, um, that we need to work hard um, to, to preserve. But in South Africa, one of the key challenges is, um, is the declining quality, particularly of maths and science in the school system. And I have to say that I really do hope that I have time um, for questions and discussions and feedback from all of you because I am continuously impressed by the level of, um, of maths and science from um, people who have been at school in Zimbabwe. So um, in my teaching, um, I think there are some people in this room that I have taught um, that I'm constantly impressed by, um, by how the, the, the sort of the challenges in the education system have, um, have not been as dire as we have experienced in South Africa. So it really makes um, it quite a challenge, and part of the, um, the focus of the initiatives that we are undertaking in the, in the Antural Society is to try and provide assistance. So, um, so the opportunities, of course, are to use technology um, like the, the Khan Academy, have you heard of the Khan Academy? Um, this was a guy in the, um, he lived I think on the west coast of the US and his brother was at, at um, college on the east coast and so he started putting together YouTube videos for his brother explaining certain of the concepts that he was grappling with in his studies and um, his brother started sharing these YouTube videos with his friends and this whole thing grew into a, a situation where you had people accessing these, um, these videos to get instruction and then receiving sort of tutoring support from, um, from, from their colleagues. And so the opportunity to try and address, for example, our crisis in maths and science teachers by having the, the, the teachers almost acting in a tutoring role, but having expert instruction available via technology is one that we can't afford not to use. So, um, so we're, we're trying to adopt this as well as you'll see in some of the initiatives to support our students in terms of, um, in terms of some of the subjects they might be struggling with on a, on a self-study basis. Another important um, uh, methodology for, um, for assisting um, students through, through the, the, um, the education system, of course, is, um, is mentorship. And, um, and our, um, um, the association we have with ASAVA, um, one of their key focuses is, um, is mentorship. Because certainly coping with um, a working, coming to terms with a working environment, with working and studying, and, and managing that life balance, mentorship is also a very important way of, um, of coping with that. And I think what I really hope to get from, um, from today's um, session is some, some feedback from you as well in terms of, of what works and what or doesn't work. And that's what I'm, I'm really quite excited about this um, Young Members Convention we have at the end of, um, of, the, end of the, the month as well, sort of bring younger members of the profession together to get their sense of what works and what doesn't work. Now, um, this is the, the, the membership of the, of the Actual Society, and as, as I was saying, we have grown fairly rapidly. Um, certainly since um, the time when I, when I qualified back in, um, in, in 1995, the, membership, the fellow membership of the, um, of the profession has, um, has almost tripled. In fact, there are um, as many female actuaries now as there were actuaries at the time when I qualified. We were quite a rare breed at, um, at the time, the, the lady actuaries. Um, but uh, but this, has, this has meant several things. First of all, that um, the resources available to us for, for tackling the kind of things I'm talking about today have certainly increased as our profession grows. As I said, we have now an office and a staff of people, and that certainly makes things a lot easier than a decade ago when literally the, the profession had almost uh, two part-time people dedicated to the day-to-day -day running of, of, um, of, of the operations. Um, but, but demographic diversity, and we often, um, demographic diversity and demographic representativity, and I, I put that out there, are not necessarily the same thing. But it really is a challenge in the context of a program where it takes more than 10 years on average to, um, to, to qualify. And at the same time, we have um, international accreditation of our education system. Um, you may be aware that the International Actual Association is, um, is looking at accrediting the, um, the education systems of the, of the member bodies up to the associate level. So it's very important that we preserve that international recognition because that's also what's helping to preserve our identity as a profession of choice. And also, of course, we play a very important role in the, in the financial services industry. So the maintenance of standards is absolutely key. So 
what is happening in the, um, from a demographic point of view in, in terms of the actual society of South Africa? Not such a pretty picture when you, when you look at this um, slide and we have 84% of, um, of the fellows are, um, are white. And, um, and when we look at the pipeline though, we see that there is a big opportunity for change. So we see that that number goes down to, to 51% when we look at the, at the student members of the profession. So things are changing, but as our demographic model indicates, it takes a very long time. In fact, over five years with the most optimistic assumptions, we literally could double our, um, our portion of, um, of African fellow members. But that's almost the best that, um, that we can hope for. In terms of, um, I was actually asked the question when I did the presentation in the US, I had my whole presentation about um, our racial diversity, and the only question I got at the end of my presentation was, well, what about gender? So I thought, well, I'd better have a slide that shows that too. <laughs> so just in case. So, um, so you can see here, this is just um, um, slightly later. So there we've got the fellows, which are now sitting at just over um, 1,100 fellows in the actual society of South Africa. And you can see, if I can get the pointer to work, that we're sitting at 20% um, um, fellows across um, all members. It's 27%, so that includes the, um, um, the, student, the student members as well. So when we're talking about the members of the profession, remember that this includes the fellows and the students who have left um, university. So um, in, in South Africa, the students only tend to join the actual society once they have completed their, um, their university studies. So what's interesting is then to look at, um, at the university um, population. These are just the stats from our, um, our intake in, at, at WITS last year. And, um, and you can see this is white, Indian, blacks and coloreds in terms of the race group that the university classifies as students. And, um, and we've got males and females, we've got 62% um, of our, um, our first year intake. And, um, and so it's very important that the measures that we put in place mean that this kind of demographic diversity is going to be preserved through the long, arduous years of study that these um, students have of them. So, um, so what are we doing about that and should we really be targeting this elusive um, demographic um, representativity? So I think what we need to be doing is to, is to be real, be, being realistic about the changes we can expect if we reach the goal of ensuring that um, according to any kind of demographic structure, the, the, the rate at which people are progressing through the exams is, um, is similar. And that's really the benchmark that we have um, have set. So what we're doing is structuring ways to offer um, better support and ensuring that our focus is in the right place. And that's really where the input um, through forums such as this is absolutely key to make sure that that focus is in place. But of course the key challenge is, the, is how do we measure um, effectiveness. And, um, and of course, it's something with those kind of pie charts, very difficult um, to demonstrate major changes in short periods of time. But the kind of things that we're involved in is, first of all, um, getting funding opportunities. So those students who possibly have the, um, have the skills, but not necessarily the financial means, um, identifying those funding opportunities in order to, um, to provide bursary support. And, um, and we have in South Africa, the South African Actuaries Development Program, which has been really successful in terms of um, offering bursaries to students for the university study. And it's more than just offering funding. Um, the program also offers support to ensure that those students are, are, are getting the opportunities they deserve. And then that additional support. And it's important, of course, that that support is appropriate to the point at which that person is in their studies. So it might be support in terms of adapting to a university setting environment and then support in terms of adapting to a working um, environment and then of course technical support in terms of the concepts that students are having to get to grips with. And then preparation for the workplace as well. So some um, students may not be familiar with, um, with even things like workplace etiquette and that's where mentoring is important. You know, you want people to feel that they are well prepared for an environment and they can perform well in that environment, and then they will perform well. Um, it's important to give people a good basis to, um, to start from and an opportunity for success. So this includes giving um, people exposure to, for example, vacation work, 
um, during, their, uh, you know, during the period of study so that they know what they're in for. I must say, my experience, my daughter's going through it now where she's in her first year of real work after university. And, um, and I remember that time as well that I was just so immensely relieved that I actually enjoyed the work that I'd been studying so long and hard to, um, to do. So as I mentioned, we have the South African Actual Development um, Program, which has, um, I mean, the mentor of that program is, is um, Cyril Ramaphosa, who's the Deputy President, so support at the highest um, level, and, um, and it's been really successful in terms of, um, of students working um, through the system, but still a lot of work to do in terms of making sure that those students are getting the support that they need. And then the Actual um, Society Development Trust, um, which is funded by um, corporate do donations um, and we're looking at ways to try and access as well some um, public funding for that and that's used to, to supplement in a lot of cases the, um, the actual training at, at um, um, university level so in my bits capacity I'm actually a benefactor of that trust and then recently we've reconstituted the actual education trust which is more focused on school based programs so this is based, uh, looking at, at initiatives to support maths and science teaching and learning at school level to try and, um, and improve the quality of, um, of candidates that are, are looking at actual science as a, as a career. And then, as I mentioned as well, ASAVA, who are um, who one of their key areas of focus is a mentorship program for, um, for people post their studies, who are uh, post their university studies, who are working towards the board exams. So the goal is to ensure that with our demographic forecasting model, that from a demographic point of view, we are, um, we are doing the best that we possibly can, considering the, uh, the environment that we're, what we're, we're working in. And it's important that, um, for example, over half of the, um, the revenue of, um, of the actual society, and of course more than half of the activities, are around education. So the, the funds that are earned from education are ploughed back into education and, um, and are used to develop new areas of, of practice to improve um, the course offerings and to provide additional support through, for example, tuition initiatives to, um, to the students. And, um, and also an important part of that learning as well is the, is the research element. Um, so we need to do a lot, and I'd suggest as a, as a professional body as well that you consider ways in which you can Promote research because that's really how we expand the, the thinking um, um, in the profession. So it's very important that um, that we are still keeping up, and in fact, in some areas, particularly our um, our banking subject, um, I've, I've I've been lucky enough to go to a number of meetings of the International Actuarial Association, and um, Michael's work on the um, on the banking subject has meant that we really are the flavor of the month. Everyone wants to talk about, to us about what we've done in, um, in, in banking and how we've managed to, to develop banking as, a, as an area of, um, of fellowship practice for, uh, for actuaries. We also now have a full-time um, uh, executive uh, responsible for education who, who is an actuary. And I think that's also making a huge difference in terms of, um, of the speed at which we are able to, um, to implement some of these um, initiatives. So some of the changes in the, um, in the South African um, actual education system, um, we have introduced a wider choice in the, um, in the level of the, the F100 subjects. So those of you familiar with the, um, the UK um, syllabus, those are the ST level subjects, um, so that, that students can actually follow. There's no longer a requirement to necessarily do an insurance or liability related subject, so students can follow a more um, investments risk management approach in terms of their subject choice. As I've mentioned, we've introduced the banking fellowship. The first exams will be written at the end of um, at the end of this year, and um, and there's a lot of interest, as I said, internationally around um, around the banking um, fellowship. And there's been some collaboration with um, with Australia. We've also been collaborating with Australia in um, in the areas of um, of employee benefits and in, in healthcare. Um, and we've had a total review of the employee benefits um, subject. So, um, so that subject is no longer just narrowly um, a patron fund subject, but more broadly around uh, managing of um, employee benefits. So very important that we make sure that um, that, that remains a core area of, um, of actuarial practice 
in the context of moving away from um, defined benefit funds to defined contribution funds, because that risk has not disappeared. It's merely been transferred to the employees, and so actually still have a very important role to play there. We've also introduced um, practice um, area certificates. There's been quite a lot of debate around the um, issue of, of practice area um, certificates, but um, but uh, I would say that a, a key area of development as well has been the normative skills. So those softer skills that we don't like to, um, to talk about. Um, I'm trying to think who it was yesterday. I think it was Christoph who said in a meeting, the right brain rubbish. Um, <laughs> but, um, but very important in the context of being relevant to our environment that we as technical people have to embrace the fact that it's all very well as having the knowledge and these skills but if we can't communicate this across to the people that it affects, then there's really no point in us having that knowledge at all. Another area where we're leading the world, of course, is um, elect electronic exams. That we actually, in South Africa, students can type um, their exams, and um, the markers, of course, love it. Um, but it's, of course, not accessible to, to everyone. So that's an area where we are treading quite carefully at the moment. So I talked about the new areas of practice. Uh, very important that as a profession, you're providing opportunities for people to fulfill their um, continuing professional development um, requirements. So as we expand, as our profession and practice, practices diversify, we also need to ensure that the CPD opportunities are, um, are diversifying as well. And of course, it's that whole debate about whether education and the contents of our syllabus leads or follows. So when there's new ways of thinking, new approaches, do we, at what stage do we um, introduce that into the, um, into the education system? So what do we need for a, a, a sustainable um, society? Of course, we need to be financially sound. I'm sure this is something that, that you as a professional body have also been um, grappling with, that um, of course you need the resources to be able to carry out your objectives, but along with that, goes this whole principle of, um, of volunteerism. And I have no doubt that, um, that today's event is really the, the result of a lot of, um, of volunteer work. And, um, and that is a core part of the sort of community element of, um, of what being part of the, the profession is about. Um, so, so I would encourage you to, um, to grow and, um, and develop that volunteerism approach because that's really the only way that things can be done. And of course, the, um, the durable operations. As I mentioned, we've been fortunate enough in South Africa that in terms of our strategic objectives, and particularly um, some of these um, transformation objectives, that we have entities where there is operational support um, to, to provide those. So of course, that has to be a goal in terms of developing those um, durable operations. And so to finish off, I just thought I would leave you with my, um, my plea always to remember that um, that as an actuary, the person that you are most accountable to is the person in the mirror. So, um, so you need to make sure that um, that professionalism is a is a core focus of of everything that you that you do, and that you are always accountable in your own individual um, capacity. So that's what really integrity is about, and um, and of course the CPD um, part of that, and um, and the giving back, which is the um, the volunteerism aspect. So I think I've covered quite a lot of ground here, but what I really would like your comments and feedback on is from the point of view of promoting diversity in our profession. What are the things that we are doing that are working and what are the things that we are doing that, that aren't working or that we could, um, that we could do better? So thanks very much for anticipation. On your statistics of black uh, South African actuaries, can I just ask how many are Zimbabweans out of the... <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 oh, it's my 60. point about what is it that you do in your maths and science here that works so well? <laughs> to be honest, our, our teachers sort of had the, the policy where if it comes to work wearing a brown jacket, then you know you're up for a hiding. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sort of uh, delivered results. Yeah. <laughs> Um, 
thank you, Rosanna. My question, uh, it's mainly on the education committee, I know in South Africa, you call it the education committee trust. Here in Zimbabwe, the ANZ has got uh, what we call the education committee, and uh, our objective is uh, to ensure that we provide a platform where students can um, grow, and one of the things that we do is um, uh, doing tutorials and mock exams, but apparently we haven't been getting much support from the students, they are not committed in writing the mock exams and they also do not want to participate in tutorials. I want to ask from your experience in South Africa, do you do tutorials or do you also do mock exams? If you do, what can we do to motivate students to partake in these mock exams so that it can be beneficial to them? Uh, I know sometimes we do it for free, but then we thought maybe if we could uh, put a charge, they will be committed. I don't know, maybe you can give us uh, an experience from South Africa. Thank you very much for that because I think that's a, a key um, area where we also are grappling a little bit with some of those issues but perhaps we can share some of the learnings. So in South Africa um, our students are getting tuition um, up to the F100 or the ST level at, um, at the universities. So there is the opportunity for them either to complete postgraduate study, so one year of honours um, course, or to attend um, as a, a occasional student some of those courses um, but that's not always within their reach so what we have um, because of the time and of course the, the financial um, part of that so so what we have been piloting just this year is uh, using an online system for for that kind of tuition support and um, and we ran a pilot for the life course in the first half of, um, of this year and what we did was we invited people to, to be sort of our guinea pigs for our pilot. And, um, and we found about half of those actively participated in terms of, um, you know, of discussion forums and in terms of doing questions. What we did was we were able to actually set up a way on the system of people swapping and marking a question. And, um, and I think that a key, a key element is that when people are paying for it or their employer is paying for it, um, that perhaps their level of commitment will, will, um, will increase. Um, but what we also do at the fellowship level as a society is we offer the tuition. So we actually offer tuition sessions where people come along to, to those sessions and then as part of that they write, um, they write a mock exam. And, um, and we found that the students who participate in those sessions, you know, they need, tend to have greater um, e exam success. And, um, but that is something that they, again, they, they pay to, to attend and, um, and it's at least uh, 25 contact hours um, of, um, of, of, of tuition. Things that we are going to be introducing from, from next year is again different levels of participation because again the financial constraint can be such that not everyone can participate. So that, um, for example, people will be able to access the, um, the online uh, material and, um, and, and even submit um, exams for, or assignments for marking and then participate um, in, in the mock exam. So, um, so I think there certainly is an opportunity for us to, um, to share our, um, our learnings because I mean we also still in the, I, I can't say I have all the answers for you, I can just tell you what we've tried. And so, so I think there's a, a great opportunity for us to, um, to collaborate and cooperate. Sorry, um, I just want to uh, add to your comments, Roseanne, um, on the student support uh, that you're doing here. And maybe to a number of students. I'm actually the chairperson of the Education Board of Actuarial Society, and I've been involved uh, in tuition support uh, since 2008 uh, for the fellowship investments. And I can tell you the statistics now. Um, I've had 14 sessions. And I think there were three bad ones where we didn't get uh, a good pass rate. But all the other 11, you find that the students who attended uh, the tuition support that I take, they would pass, the pass rate was between 50% and 62% of fellowship level. And then against an average of uh, uh, 30% or 20% even sometimes for the students who didn't attend. So, it's in your best interest if there is at least that kind of support that's being offered um, as a student at whatever level to actually attend. Because we can just illustrate with statistics. And I've got how many years? Six years now, seven years of experience of actually just sitting and look, uh, you have to attend it. If they are not supporting, that's unfortunate. Maybe they are more brilliant than 
<laughs> but, but the bottom line is just try and attend and, and speed up your, your process of qualifying. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I've got two questions. No, I've got one question and one plea for you. Uh, I'll start with the plea. Right? Um, I'm with the National Peace of Science and Technology, and really uh, your presentation was quite informative. We are in the process of trying to get the accreditation from the institute, but we are still grasping with uh, issues of having to do with staff. Uh, I can say at the moment, we only have got two full-time lecturers and one part-time for the whole actual program. So my plea to the actual society is that uh, if there are ways in which the university of the can collaborate, uh, we'll be very much, uh, we'll very much appreciated. We can't do it on our own. We also need the support from the industry. Now, the second uh, contribution or question that I have is, you talked about the banking fellowship and also the new route where you have got risk management and investment. Uh, so how does your banking fellowship and the risk management and investment fellowship compare with the CFA qualification? In fact, that's probably what in your talk you're going to... Yeah, okay. There was a question behind you. Maybe we should just take that while we're passing the... Is there one or one here? Do you want to take that question and then we can pass them up? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just hoping to get a bit of context so that we can maybe better evaluate how successful we have outside of classifying the profession. Uh, what's that busy like in other of those popular uh, professions, elite professions like medicine and engineering? Yeah, actually, let me just address that first because that's something we've actually, um, we've been having some discussions with SAICA, which is the, um, the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants and, um, and the, the lawyers. And, um, and we actually, I'm pleased to say we seem to have more constructive initiatives um, in place um, to, to, you know, to, to actively promote, um, promote the, the, the demographic change. But the, the challenge is across all the professions. In fact, there was recently um, a, a meeting um, called by, um, I think it was the, the Department of, um, of um, what is Rob Davies? He's trade and industry, yeah, um, on, on, for all the, these professions. And um, Asaba attended on one part of the, the actuarial profession. And, um, and they really are all in the same boat. So, so one of the things that we are doing, for example, is collaborating with Saika in terms of the school's outreach program, you know, in terms of um, promoting the, the professions and what you need and, and trying to almost, um, you know, light that fire um, in, in, in school, at schools at an earlier age because of the fact that maths is a discipline and, um, and, and to sort of almost have that demand-driven um, call for improvements in the in maths and science curriculum. But you're right, it is a challenge across all professions. Um, uh, that's the question on comparison with CFA. Uh, the simple answer is that they are, you can't compare. There is, there is no comparison. Uh, so CFA is uh, investments, and, and I think if you do it, I mean, it does give you a, a lot of other different tools to help you as an investment professional. But the subject we're talking about here, which is uh, the first one, which is ST9, which you can check on um, the, the UK website, and for us it's F106, which you can check on our website. You see that the syllabus is very different. Well, there will be small overlaps, but very different. It's focused on risk management, enterprise risk management, which you know, talk, uh, talk about, I think, later. The banking subject, is, uh, you don't have any of that information out yet, but it's very different. That one, you can't even, CFA is, is not there. This is completely new and different, so let's talk about it later. In fact, when we embarked on the, um, on the development of the banking subject, I had a conversation with Sim Shabalala, who's one of the managing directors of Standard Bank, and I actually asked him how he would feel about employing a banking actuary as opposed to someone with a CFA. And uh, now he's a CA by, uh, by profession, 
And, and his, his answer to me was quite insightful. He said that he would prefer to employ an actuary because they understand both sides of the balance sheet, whereas a CFA is focused purely on the asset side of the balance sheet. And in, the, in this world, in this environment, you actually need advisors who are, who are looking at, at the balance between the balance and the balance sheet. So, um, so I thought that actually for a CA, it was quite a good insight in terms of what we do as actuaries in the bank. <laughs> <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted a clarification on one point which I saw on your slide, where you were saying specialist area abolished for qualification. Oh, thank you. Yes, I think that was in the context of the uh, of the practice area, the practice area certificates. So this has been an area where there has been some debate because um, what was abolished was practicing certificates in those areas where there isn't a statutory role. And, um, and the concern was that if you, if you do that, it's like the cart before the horse, then you will never create a statutory role for actuaries in that space. So, um, so we have a situation at the moment that there are um, practicing certificates in the areas of, um, of life and, and, and pensions. And, um, and we still have in the healthcare space, because the, um, the health actuaries, of which I'm one, have been fighting grimly for there to be some kind of, of statutory recognition. At the moment, ironically, the regulator requires the submission of a document with pricing, for, for, for the use of the pricing, that complies with our guidance, but they don't require an actuary to sign it off, which is most bizarre. Um, so, so it kind of, it's, it's, it's the, you know, does the statutory role follow or lead in terms of, of practice area certificates? So that's where, where that, um, that debate comes. And actually, interestingly enough, in the last um, week or so, um, the, there has been this um, uh, definition, I'm trying to think what the wording is that the FSB has used in terms of a um, <coughs> what the word that they release in that um, document for a, a fit and proper, the fit and proper standards um, for, um, for valuators, for example, and it isn't referred to the practicing certificate. <laughs> so we're a little bit alarmed by that and that's something that we're following, we're following up on. But it was, it was really that debate around you know, whether there should be practice area certificates where there isn't a statutory role. Thank you very much, Roseanne. Uh, just a round of applause. You know, uh, one thing that amazed me about your presentation is the breadth and depth of thought that is to go into moving the profession forward and achieving diversity. I think there were a lot of uh, notes that we were able to take on that and uh, so many learning points and uh, I believe we'll be able to engage with them, uh, we'll continue to engage us as a whole, uh, as a profession so that we move forward. Um, it's, it's, it's quite pleasing to learn that people like Michael, Michael is, is from here, <laughs> which is, has been driving even innovation to the point of having a subject launched. Um, we, we are very much appreciative of that. Uh, you know, when she mentioned mentorship and uh, there was one question that came from someone saying, uh, I'm actually going to beg for something. I thought he was going to say, Roseanne, could you be my mentor? <laughs> <laughs> and that got me worried. But I think what we'll do is, uh, as a profession, I think we'll sort of work around that so that we can take notes from Roseanne. So please don't write an email and say, I want you to be my mentor. Just wait for David and company to work it out, and they'll be able to get back to you. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Roseanne. Is, uh, I invite Jessica to give you a small present. We've got a present, a token of appreciation for you coming out, coming down here and being able to give this presentation. Jessica. Yeah, uh, Roseanne at worldonline.co.za. 